Where are our black voices? Voices of intellectual, financial, and spiritual freedom for which we bled and fought. Did they just disappear with united black consciousness and progressive black thought? Who is writing for us? Where are our black journalists, our black media armies, and brave woke writers that swing their pens like a mighty sword? Where are the descendants of Freedom's Journal, the first black newspaper launched in the 1820s when our voices roared? Who's ensuring that we're protected and well represented? Who will personify my voice, your voice, our voice, while writing stories about black joy, black camaraderie, and how we uniquely congregate to rejoice? We need and depend on black writers, black researchers, and black commentators to fight the multitude of covert wars raged against us. Our stories and experiences are beautiful and vast. Collectively, we've healed from trauma and have evolved our past. So calling all young black voices equipped with ready pens to write stories that highlight black excellence, perseverance, and health awareness in mass. Because we've progressed past stories of the back of the bus. And now we need black voices that represent me as we and they as us. Pan Africa. Welcome to Melanated Conversations. Our narrative and our perspective. Here on the podcast, we are amplifying the voices of black women and sharing their powerful stories of transformation. I'm Tarian. And I'm Yana. Let's start the show. Welcome back to another episode of Melanated Conversations. I am your co-host, Tyrion. And I'm your co-host, Yana. Yes. um, Welcome back, guys. We're back for another wonderful episode today. There's so many things I want to say. Let me let me start off right. I want to welcome our very special guests. We always bring wonderful women on to highlight them. And so to have Tiana Darden with us today, and she is a content marketing writer and freelance writing coach. And she's going to share all the wonderful things that she's doing and help how she's helping women um, and people, you know, get their writing game up to par. So welcome, Kriana. Thank you for joining us today. Yes. yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to yes. be here. Yes, I'm excited. It's an about... exciting day. No, well, it is an exciting day because by the time <laughs> that this is recorded, so you guys, we're recording on Inauguration Day, so that's yeah. first and foremost, you know, we can yeah. breathe a little <laughs> sigh. We, we're breathing a little easier today. <laughs> um, um, but no, but also, I'm just, I've been actually really excited to talk to Quiana um just be, from the writer side because y'all know I love to write and Aww. um she just kind of tugging in my heartstrings when I was when she um when they reached out and I was like oh my gosh she's all the things I can't wait to talk about all this so <laughs> yes welcome thank you for saying yes thank you and, yeah yes, for having this chat with us today before we actually get into the chat though we always like to play a little round of fun which we call don't drop the mic um don't worry it's not i don't think it's too bad and plus we'll play like we'll play yeah. with you as well so you're not left along in this all right so you are you down I, i'm ready okay okay yeah. okay so we're just gonna do one gotta go so i'm gonna give you okay. a list of four things and you have to tell me which one will have to go and I think Terry okay. added this last time. One has to go forever. Is forever. that the case? Forever. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she added that rule. So, okay. So we're going to do an R&B group. Mm, okay. And these are black male R&B groups. Um, so we have New Edition, Drew Hill, Boys to Men, or Jodeci. Okay, so not Drew Hill. I love them. Um, Jodeci. 
Jodeci okay. has to go forever. Yes. Why? Like in everything, are we talking like everything and associated with them or just like their music? Because you know a lot, sometimes other things are like, you know, branched in with certain groups or people mm-hmm. and producers and writers. Maybe I'm going too deep, but. I mean, <laughs> here's the thing. If we're saying it has to go forever, then that means anything that I guess would be. They can't exist. Whatever kind of impact they had, that means they do not exist. Oh, wow. That's hard. So. Why would you? Why did you go with Jodeci? Yeah, just curious. Because I love New Editions. Can you stand the rain? So I don't want to ever get rid of that. Mm-hmm. I love most of Drew Hill's songs, so I can't get rid of them. Boys to Men. I don't know. They're just classic. They have great like Christmas music. Yeah. And <laughs> so Jodeci, I like Jodeci, but I only like a couple of songs, so they would go. No, I'm I'm with you on that. Um. I'm sorry, Terry. I know you're probably supposed to just traditionally go first since I threw out the question, but I'm just going to kind of like piggyback real quick. <laughs> I agree with her, especially on Jodeci. I, honestly, oh gosh, this might be telling my age. I don't know. Well, not necessarily. I, I was young when they were like prominent, but I really wasn't like deep into their music like I was the others. And just like yeah. you said, like new edition. Well, New Edition before Jodeci, but that's different though. You know, New Edition just had an impact. If it wasn't for New Edition, there would be no boys to me. You know, so exactly um, right. Yeah. So it's like they they kind of like I don't want to say the 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 grandfathers, but they are kind of the grandfathers of R and B a little bit in that sense. So you can't you can't yeah. get rid of the classic. And you know, I no. love Mr. Drew Hill. I love I love, I love, I love Drew Hill. <laughs> Um, and boys to me, like, I didn't even think about Christmas. You know, if you don't hear, let them snow, let yeah, it snow, exactly. snow, let it snow. Exactly. It that's almost as, that's right up there with temptations, you know? Oh, you yeah. Know. oh yeah, yeah. For sure. Why well, no. what? You said one yay alone. Like, uh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Right. It, mm-hmm. And I ain't, I'm going to throw in a bonus for one day the way he was moving on Dancing with the Stars, you know? I, I, <laughs> he, won that, he won that year. Did he really? Yeah. I think I he did. Know. Don't quote me on that, y'all. Don't be don't don't all in my DMs tell me I was wrong. I think so. He was in the top. I do know that much. I didn't know that. Okay. That's interesting. I didn't either. Hmm. This is, no, this is a very difficult question. Um, I agree with y'all. New edition has to stay. Um, simply because I mean, <laughs> uh, New Edition they like they did like a not a metamorphosis. I don't know what the word I know what the word is, but I can't think of it right now. Where they just kind of like split and then divided and split mm-hmm. and divided. Like you had Belle Bib DeVoe, uh, then of course the, um, Bobby, Bobby, mm-hmm. um, and then who else came in? Uh, for a little bit, Johnny Gill oh, came. Yeah, in. Johnny Gill. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, you, you New Edition was like the mecca, like the core mm-hmm. of you know R and B boy boy band groups, or not boy band, but boy boy groups. Um, and like y'all said, there would be no boys to men without New Edition. So those go hand in hand. Now, something interesting that I did find out recently. Um. It's not a huge connection, but uh, Cisco did an interview and he was talking about how um, with Joe to see how um, Casey, I mean, Jojo has that uh, signature, oh yeah, type mm-hmm. of thing he does in all his mm-hmm. songs. And he was saying when Drew Hill was getting together and even when he was getting ready to go solo, he was like, everybody has like a signature trademark kind of like thing they do with their voice. It sets them apart. And he was like, for him, he was like, I wanted to to imitate JoJo, um, but make it his own. And so mm-hmm. when he just said, yeah, 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 like yeah. I see that. he yeah. took JoJo's, ooh, yeah, and like made it his own. Yeah. But, okay. But, 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 sorry, Drew Hill. I'm keeping Jodeci. I'm keeping Jodeci because there would be no yeah from Cisco if it were not for <laughs> JoJo uh, and Jodeci. And I mean, you know, black leather, like Jodeci yeah. made R&B boy groups. They they did something different with it. They turned them kind of into bad boys. They started to be able to 
even Were they part the of that new jack swing sound kind of what that new jack like kind of ushering in that movement a little bit but more so like their image they were kind of like bad boys where mm. you know, addition of boys to men were not did not have like bad boy imagery really now bobby brown kind of started to shift that when he went off solo by himself but right i you know jodeci was like all black leather we gonna grind on stage with our sunglasses on because we've been doing all god knows what before we came on stage um yeah. and we're gonna give y'all a show and then i think you know drew hill was able to make it their own you know, to a certain degree, and in in their own right, they have done some really cool things. But and I love Drew Hill, but I Drew Hill. <laughs> wow, wow! Well, come uh, on with the music history lesson. That was fun. right. That was fun. That was fun. That was fun. Thank you for playing with us, Quiana. Yeah, we appreciate yeah, it. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we are gonna, actually going to go into um, our melanated chat because we want to hear all the things. Um, I'm over here. I may be over here taking notes. So don't mind me if you see me writing some stuff down. Okay. <laughs> um, but no, um, Terry, you want to throw out our first question? Yes, of course. So Kiana, can you tell us just a little bit about your backstory, your roots? Who is Kiana Darden? Uh, you know, inform the people, inform the listeners a little bit about your story. You can share as much as you want or as little as you want, but we, you know, we'd like to get to know you a little bit more. Okay. Well, I'm um, originally from Virginia. Let's take it all the way back. And that's where I live now. I live in Richmond, Virginia. Um, my background educationally is in education. I was an elementary school teacher for six and a half years. Um, once upon a time, I wanted to be a school principal. So I went back to school and got my master's in K-12 administration um, and was like on that path toward becoming a school principal. Um, but when my daughter was like four years old, I realized that I wanted to homeschool her. And so I knew that I needed to make a transition from working in the schools to being able to work at home so that I could homeschool her when she started kindergarten. And that's when I went on this path to try to figure out a business that I could work from home. It eventually led to me being a freelance writer and that business just took off for me. So um, I started my freelance writing business in June of 2018 and I've been writing ever since. Wow, we have something in common. I know you and Yana have the right thing in common, but I was actually an educator as well, a special education teacher. So, oh, awesome. Um, how how old is your daughter, if you don't mind sharing? She's, she just turned seven. Okay. Last month. Okay, then. Yeah. So we've, got, we've got that a little bit in common as well. Our youngest mm-hmm. daughters are seven, eight, six, six yeah. seven. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay, yeah. what um what level were you for? special education what level like middle high elementary well I was in I I went from elementary and jumped to high school <laughs> oh gotcha okay <laughs> which was I I enjoyed elementary just because especially when you're in special education you know there there's a you, you can be a lot more nurturing to a certain degree just in general in special education mm-hmm. but um a lot of times administrators tend to really be like nitpicky and down your throat about a lot of stuff when it comes to special education in elementary school opposed to mm-hmm. in high school I had a lot more freedom um yeah. to be able to do certain things within my classroom that I really enjoyed but right after a while that does take a toll on you and, and I was in a um behavioral unit so I'm not a very big woman and that took a toll on me emotionally and right physically. so yeah yeah Mm-hmm. No, I always say like I um I I had the I had the adult kids. I I, I worked in a, my background is in HR, so I feel like it it, it feels oh, yeah. like sometimes that parallels with education to me. <laughs> so yeah, I had I, get that. I had the parents of y'all's kids. So um, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's cool. So kind of walk us a little bit through your journey into writing. And how you pivoted from, you know, starting as, you know, a side hustle along with your job into a full time business that you do now. Yeah. So I'm going to take a step back before I actually became a freelance writer is I became a general virtual assistant. That was the first business that I'd ever tried where I was like consistently making some money. (laughs) And so but I realized pretty early on, probably within the first like couple of months, I only did that for a few months, that I really enjoyed the writing task. So that's when I transitioned from saying I'm a general virtual assistant to I am a content marketing writer. 
And so I started that. And um, I, like I said, I knew that I wanted to eventually quit my job and start writing full time. So from the beginning, I was very focused on how could, what would be the smartest way for me, me to be able to get the most bang for my buck in terms of the amount of time that I had av- available to work on my business. since I was working full time and I had my daughter. Um, so I really focused on finding like those retainer clients. So those were clients who I worked with every single month, like who needed blog content and I could get money from them every single month consistently. Um, and I focused on those assignments where I could get paid a good amount of money, um, instead of like a bunch of small projects. So I was just able to consistently book those gigs and it made the transition pretty easy. Um, I got to a certain point where I was making a good amount in my writing business and I was making the same amount I made in my teaching business. And even though when you're a business owner, it's not like a direct correlation because you still have to pay taxes and all that kind of stuff. But I figured that if I could reach that amount while working my job, that I felt confident in my ability to quit my job and be able to make more. So um, after about six, so January, I quit in the middle of the school year. It was January when I stopped uh, teaching. Actually, so the 22nd of January will be the second year. That was like my last day teaching. Um, So that'll be my two-year anniversary. But I just stopped teaching and then I went into my business full-time from there. Yeah, that's dope. The fact that you were, the fact that you were able to be like, like you, you figured out fairly quickly, like what worked for you. And like you were saying, um, like you knew in order to be able to make a certain amount of money, it was like not to take on these smaller jobs, but bigger projects in order to, you know, make sure that you were successful, but also still you feeling your passion as well. And enough to the point where you could be like, deuces. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I totally understand. That is no, I think we all yeah. understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed it. Did you say how long you were in education? Six and a half years. Six yeah. and a half, okay. Yeah, I was like, I thought that was for soon. Um, I want to know, how did you find the motivation to keep, how do you find the motivation to keep writing uh, when it feels impossible to succeed? And how do you approach your projects in specific? I know a lot. Of, I'm not a writer, but I hear writer's block. Ooh, this is a, a question for bunch. me. I hear, oh, yeah. this <laughs> I is hear a question for me. I need to know <laughs> how do you write through those hard, on those hard days or especially like, well, and I have a kind of another question after this to you, just especially like, you know, with how cha- time changes and, you know, different things that we experience, um, especially as uh, Black individuals, like the emotion sometimes is tied to certain things. And like, how do you, on those days, like when you have a writing assignment, like, and it's hard, not even just when it's relating to something like that, but just how do you find yeah. the motivation to keep writing through? Yeah. Yeah. So between when it's hard and, you know, when things get really tough. So I, that immediately makes me go back to when George Floyd was murdered and there was all of that going on. And my mind was in like so far away from work. It was one of the toughest times that I've had right like in my business. And so like when things get tough, like in that realm or just I have a hard day, writer's block, I'm tired, whatever. One thing that I do in my business is I make sure that I don't wait until the last minute to start working on my projects because it doesn't give me any flexibility. So like when George Floyd was murdered, I took a week off. I just did not do anything. Um, I told my clients, I'm not going to be responding to emails, blah, blah, blah. So sometimes if things like that happen, I will just take a step back. Um, But if it's just like a day-to-day writer's block or whatever, I had this last night. I had a project that I was working on and I just kept working on it. And it, it was not flowing for me. I just stopped because I realized that if I just sit at my computer and I just stare at the screen and keep trying, it's not, it doesn't tend to get better for me. But knowing that I have that, uh, my deadline set out further, I know that I have like extra days built in that I can actually do the work. Um, sometimes if it gets really tough for me, I will do some light outsourcing. So if that's getting someone to like write my uh, outline um, or do some research for me or something, like I will have like my assistant or someone like, can you just research this for me so I don't have to do the entire process by myself? 
because like my my mind is not in it. So sometimes doing little things like that will help too. But um, generally, if I have any type of writer's block, I'm not going to write because it. I'm just going to wait until later that day, the next day, or something. Um, and also, one thing that I do is I build I build in days off in my business. Like I make sure that I'm not writing every single day. Um, um, so I think that definitely helps a lot. That's interesting. Cause I was like, I always assume like you have to like write a little bit every day. So that, I, I thank you for that confirmation. Cause I always <laughs> kind of like try to put that pressure on myself. Like you got to write something every day. Even if it's like two, two lines, write something. And sometimes I'm like, I'm just not in it. And people can, they will know that from the other side, from reading the piece, if you, you weren't in it that at that that particular moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I know your your writing is more in the financial space. Um, what kind of made you choose that path of writing? And is there any other type of style of writing that you like to write? Yeah, so I chose finance when I was thinking about what niche I wanted to go into. I thought about the type of you know things that I have interest in, and I love money, so I write mm-hmm. a lot about money. It's just something that I like, and it's also one of the top writing niches in terms of what you can get paid a good amount for to write about. Um, So I, I included like something that's profitable and I included something that I like and I'll put those two together. So I do a lot of finance writing. Um, But I also like, I actually write about HR. I've been writing a weekly HR column for a publication for the last year and a half. I really enjoy HR, even though I have no HR background. I think it's really cool. So I like writing about it. Um, I also write about small business topics. I like, you know, business in general. So those, I feel like those are the three that I tend to go to, like HR, finance, business related topics. Cool. Had you always kind of had the writing bug, like even growing up? It was just natural. Like I've always been a good writer. Like when I got my master's degree, I, um, it was just a bunch of papers. I flew through that program so easily because <laughs> I can I can research and write a paper all day long. So it made sense for me to be able to go in writing. But when I was younger, I wrote more poetry with my journal. I wrote like many, like, I would start writing a book and then stop writing like that kind of stuff. Um, this is a good use that skill. Yes, yes, yes. Um. More kind of back on to like writing. So sometimes when I read um, a lot of news articles, most often I find that the black or POC voice on topics is often missing. Um, there are many writers of color with you know knowledge and skill to professionally unpack topics that are intertwined with our identities and cultures. From your perspective, why do you why are certain news topics from your perspective told through a white lens? I think it's because it's what it makes them more comfortable. You know, they don't want to step outside of the box that they're used to or that they want to share. Um, so it's easier to go to the same pool over and over the same types of people um, instead of stepping out and realizing that there are other perspectives, there are other ways to tell a story, there are other people who can tell a story. Um, and so they just stick to what know. And so, I mean, that's really unfortunate, but one thing that I am seeing more is that, you know, when they're making calls for writers, they're sometimes specifically saying, I'm looking for BIPOC, like Black and Indigenous indigenous people of color, to do the assignment. So that is good that some outlets are making more of a concerted effort to include Black voices and other people of color in there, you know, as, as far as people who are writing for them. But one thing I've found, which I think is great, is a lot of my clients that I've worked with, um, especially some of my personal brand clients, they're like, I've been looking for a Black writer. I've been looking for, because I speak to Black women, I speak to Black men, and I feel like it's a different voice that I need to come, you know, for the for the words that are being written for my company. And so they come to me and I'm, they're like, I'm so glad that I found a Black female writer because I'm speaking to Black women or whatever. Yes. And so I think that makes me feel good because I'm able to like, fill that gap you know there's a void obviously in that area being able to find like a good quality writer who can speak very well to a black audience so that always makes me feel good yeah that that is good because that was actually going to be another question of mine is like are you finding it hard to you know well you've built up your rapport and your your kind of your base now but 
have you had like some struggle with, you know, trying to find an assignment or get accepted for an assignment for, for writing, um, in that, in, in some of those like markets? Yeah. I think that honestly, when I first got started, most of my clients are not people of color. So I didn't really have struggles getting started um, in that way. But I definitely did find over time that a lot of people would come to me for, you know, because I'm a Black woman and they were looking for Black female writers. Um, yeah, I know that the question wasn't uh, geared towards me, but I'd like to put some input in and just say that I, I personally think a lot of times why stories aren't told or are whitewashed or told from a white perspective is because it's more palatable to certain audiences. A lot of times, and not all the time, but I think this is one reason why it's important for us to be able to enter those spaces and to have a voice in those spaces. But a lot of times um, our experience, our, our experiences tend to have some sort of trauma wrap in them. And so then everyone else is like, I just, I can't digest it. That's too much. They don't want to hear it, blah, 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 blah. But then on the other side of that is that not all of our experiences are wrapped in trauma. And so to be able to hear perspectives from us, from our, just Black joy and our, and our experiences and be like, hey, like not everything that we experience or deal with or our perspective on things is wrapped in trauma too. And, to, and so that helps to change you know, the narrative um, and what other people perceive of the Black experience, too. So Yeah, I, I, I get what you, you're saying there, too. And I wasn't actually thinking from the trauma standpoint. I was thinking just from just the knowledge standpoint. Like, yeah. we have the knowledge, thinking from just how Quiana writes more in the finance space, like, we we have the knowledge. There are people that are equipped with that knowledge that can tell those type of stories, too, or write in those um, voices and be represented in that space too. Um, so sometimes I just, and this could just, I could just be, it just could just be me. Um, but sometimes I feel like there could be more, not saying that there, there aren't any, but there could be more done. And, uh, to Leanna's point, I'm glad to see that, you know, we're moving in a direction where a variety of voices are to, are being represented because that's, you know, how can we speak to people if we're not speaking to from the voice of everyone? Like we're not reaching, like we're not involving all the voices um, to be included because not everybody has the same experience in those right. spaces. Right. So, yeah, I think it, it it's a combination of what you mentioned, too, as well. So, no, but that's 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 good. That's good. I'm glad to see that it's projecting in yeah. that way. Um, I sorry, actually too. want to piggyback on something that you said, Tarian. Um and, and this is an unfortunate point. I do kind of feel like in some instances when they do make calls for Black writers, they want a lot of the stories to be, you know, what is cultural this? Or what is your, you know, have you ever had a, a racist that? Or how do you feel about, you know, and it, it is from a Trump perspective. That really bugs me because every time there's a call for writers who are Black, it should not be so you can share something traumatic. Like I can write about being a mom and the joys of motherhood, not how yes. being a you know something bad related to being a black mom or not the racist part of being a black mom. I struggled in this, um, so that is a frustration of mine for sure. That I say, like we don't have to just write about bad things that affect our lives or in our you know culture in general. Yes, yes that's exactly. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Because that's what yeah. you packed it in a way I think I couldn't say. So, yes, thank you. For saying yeah. that. <laughs> no, that's true. Because um, we see that in other ways, too, not even just from a writing perspective. Like, sometimes you have those friends that might reach out to you like, what's that? What's your perspective? on?" And it's always we're black. Yes, that's that's how we identify. That's our culture. That's who we are. But we are more than just a black individual. We're not and yeah. we're not also the expert in all things black yeah, yeah, so correct. sometimes you want to be separated from just that but you also want to be <laughs> included in the wider conversations that if we as like people don't ask like 
you know, white people like, what's the white perspective? Like, what's, right. what's, how do you feel like as a mother, how, like things like that? No, we just want it to just be a discussion um, and still include our expertise and st- still include our voice. So, exactly. yeah. yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to simmer down. I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't know. <laughs> Well, <laughs> moving right along, let Yana calm down a little bit. Oh, let's, talk about, no, let's, <laughs> let's talk about let's let's talk about your four step framework um, that you developed. How did you come up come up with this concept, and why is it so useful for for writers? So this initially used to be a six step framework. When I first really realized or decided that I was going to start helping writers build their own business, um, which was in August of 2020. So it was last year. Um, But I looked at my experience because I was often asked, well, how were you able to, you know, find your success as a writer so quickly? How are you able to transition from education to being a writer? Like all of these questions, which led to eventually becoming a freelance writing coach and helping others launch their businesses. Um, And so I initially had a six step framework, realized that, you know, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with launching a business, especially if you're working a nine to five and you have all these other things going on. So I broke it down into four steps to make it as simple as possible. Um, So it's like my four step framework, which is um, you start by identifying your goals for your writing business. So do you want to write full time or part time? Do you want this to be your only job? Um, how much money do you want to make each month? How many hours do you want to work in your business each month? Because all this information, and there's more to it, but that's just like a really general, but all this information is going to inform the type of writing business that you start. Um, Because I think that a lot of times when you're starting a business, we might start a business based on um, what we see other people doing. But if that doesn't fit our lifestyle goals, then it's it's, you're going to wind up building the wrong business for you. So it's really thinking about like what your goals are for your writing business. From there, picking your niche. I think it's really important to choose a niche in your writing business. And so it's just the process of knowing, do you want to do content marketing writing or copywriting? Or do you want to write for financial industries or in the medical industry? Like So choosing like one to three really good um, profitable industries that you can write in and then building a portfolio based on those pieces um, with like at least three really good quality portfolio pieces. Um, and then from there you go and you start marketing your business. Um, and so there are tons of different ways to get marketing jobs. I found great success with like cold pitching. That's really how I got started between Facebook groups and cold pitching my services. That was how I got to the point where I could quit my job. Um, and then a referrals from the clients that I've had. Um, so whether you want to do Facebook groups or social media, LinkedIn, um, cold pitching, whatever it is, but developing your strategy for inbound, meaning they come to you and outbound, meaning you're going out to find the clients, a marketing strategy for that, and then putting your systems all in place. So making sure you have like your contracts, your discovery calls set up and your invoicing and all the things that you're going to need to actually onboard clients into your business and make sure you have all the tools that you need to run your company. So you follow those four steps and that's a good um, place to be, you know, when you launch your writing business to be able to start booking clients. Wow. Yeah. You definitely, you basically roll out the whole blueprint from inception to literally execution of your and running your business from start to finish. Um, Gosh, when you were talking, something came up and I completely lost the question. Hopefully it'll come back to me while I'm I'm gathering my thought. Um, so when you were creating this framework, was it just more of a tweaking of your own like process or things that worked or things that you also just wanted to like, you wish you hadn't known when you started? Yeah, it's like a combination. So I sat back and I thought, okay, how did I do this? <laughs> you know, and when people would keep asking me, how did you do this? How did you do this? I had to really sit back and think, well, how did I do it? And I thought about some of the mistakes that I made or, you know, things that I could have done differently. And so in developing this, I thought based on one, what did I do? And two, what could I have done differently to be able to achieve my goal, you know, as quickly as possible? And so that's what this is based off of. Got it. And anyone can jump in this and apply it to no matter what style of writing that they they do, like what they how they want to take their business. This is like this is like a open blueprint for you to start your business in that way. Yeah. As long as you plan on working directly with clients, 
Like if you want to start your own blog and make money or you want to sell your own eBooks and things like that, it, you know, it won't support you with that. But if you want to write emails for clients, so, social media for clients, um, blog posts for clients, um, or whatever other type of writing, this will work for you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you guys, we'll talk more about, you know, how you can plug in and get connected with Kiana and her work and how you can, you know, become a client, you know, and help how she can help you walk, work through and starting your business if this is of interest. Um, what are a few myths that come up when it comes to this business or as it relates to you being a freelance writer um, just in general? I think that people think that being a freelance writer means that you have to be like a starving artist and you have to like accept these really low paying jobs and um, that there's not enough value in the service that you're offering. And that is like the furthest from the truth. So what I like to tell people is that really like, don't just say you're going to be a writer, but if you're going to write for clients, understand the value that you're bringing to them. So like, if you think that blog posts, you know, a lot of people say blogging is dead and no one reads blog posts and all of that kind of stuff. But then, well, why are companies paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a blog post? There's mm -hmm. obviously some value, but if you don't understand the value that you're bringing to your clients, you're going to think it's okay for someone to pay you $50 to write a 1500 word blog post because you don't know the value that you're bringing to them. Um, if you don't understand the importance of writing an email, that can help them sell a product or nurture their audience, then you're going to think that it's okay to get paid $20 to write an email because it might not take you that long to do it. So it's like, realize that freelance writing doesn't mean that you have to get paid really low rates. Um, another one is that there are a lot of writers, especially overseas writers who are paying, who are charging like literally pennies for their work. But that doesn't mean that we have to pay, you know, to charge that same amount for our work. We're not competing with the writers who are charging five dollars for a blog post. Like that's not your competition. Ooh, and so realize I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like five dollars for a blog post. And it's like that's not who you're competing with. Um, so that's one really big one. Another one would be that, and I guess this is maybe just in general, is that you have to have all of this confidence when you get started. Like you just have to, your confidence has to be on a level one hundred for you to take action. And that's not the truth. Um, I always tell people, you know, you want to take action. Action's going to lead to results. Results are going to lead to you building your confidence. For me, I didn't know what I was doing when I was getting started. But once I got that first client who paid me and they liked the work, then I said, oh, okay, I feel confident in this. Let me go do it again. And then the next person said they were happy. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it again. And then that person referred me and I said, okay, I'm going to do it again. And so that made me feel confident. It wasn't like I just, you know, did all the research in the world and I just immersed my, like I had a coaching call and he said, I've been immersing myself in the world of freelance writing. I've been reading all the books. I've been watching all the trainings. I've been reading all the blogs. And I'm like, that's wonderful. But what have you done? So it's like, you have to actually take action and that is going to make you feel more confident um, over time. Yes, you word. spoke a word there. I was I over here like, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> no, because sometimes we are in our own way and we don't have to be like, you don't, no one knows the ins and outs of everything that comes with their job, but they do it. We can talk, we can say that from the, from the president. So the top, post in this exactly. nation <laughs> but no one in that role knows everything or comes right. in and knowing everything so it is just something as simple as you know starting it's always a thing and getting out of your own way and you know and just leading with what you got because as you go no matter whatever you do as long as you're committed to that you're going to grow through that thing um and it kind of reminds us with this podcast we had no clue what we were doing <laughs> Terry, like Terry said she started in education I was in HR that is no relation into podcasting or digital media, any realm or space. Um, yeah. And to be in season four in this, we just sometimes, sometimes we still wake up and like, yeah, <laughs> is this for real? People still listening right. to us? But no, it, but that is so true. It's so true. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to hold you, Kiana, because I, 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 
I I peeped at your work. You you doing it? It's no oh, reason. I mean, you. there's a reason why they're coming back to you, um, for you know the the because the value that you add and yeah. So yes, you doing yeah. Your I was just saying that. Thank um, you. I was just saying that basically the same thing that y'all was just saying. Um, you know, that's a word for just anything in life or any, anything that you do in general. Uh, number yeah. one is recognizing your worth and, and your talent. Um, and then just stepping out and just taking the action to do whatever it is that you, you know what I mean? Your passion, the thing that you're passionate about. Um, and then everything else will just kind of uh, snowball. Fall into place, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and fall right. into place for you. So I, I love that. Like I said, you know, I don't, writing per se doesn't resonate with me because that's not my gifting. Um, But at the same time, there's so many gems and tools that I can take just from the things that you shared with us today. So I appreciate that so very much. Your demeanor is so like, I don't know. Isn't it just like, like, isn't she just like, just, just, I don't know. It's like a... (laughs) comforting regal type of oh yeah, regal, so, regal yeah, not yeah. in a bougie way regal yeah yeah you're right. like i'm just here <laughs> <laughs> share some knowledge with you all yes that is it no cockiness with it i love it first of all i feel like oh, thank you cocky, but thank you for i don't know just being you and being present here in this moment today oh, thank y'all <laughs> yes um, before we come to a close, close, excuse me, we um, always like to ask our guests a couple of closing questions. So my closing question for you is, um, do you have anything new coming up, any projects coming up um, this year? I know you said you re- things really started to kind of kick off back in August, but is there yeah. anything coming up this year that we could be looking out for? Yeah. So um, depending on when this comes out. Um, my coaching program, My For Profit, is continuing to have new cohorts throughout the year. Um, so the next one's kicking off in February at some at some point next month. Um, and then it'll be out again in the spring and in the summer. So um, that is something that I'm really excited about because I get to work with people live over, over six weeks. Um, or actually, I just bumped it up to eight weeks on their uh, writing business. So that is something really exciting that's coming up. Awesome. How many do you accept in your cohort? I usually keep it fairly small, so like no more than ten. Okay. okay well, person. yeah, I hear that. If you want to get, if you want to get involved, <laughs> well, by the yeah. time this is air, you might have missed her first cohort. But definitely stay plugged into the things that she has coming up. Um, yeah, I was trying to peep over the schedule, but it's a little too small in my stigmatism. Yeah, you got to get your glasses <laughs> on. You get- I have a stigmatism too. I get it. Oh, I do too. Just. <laughs> That little being boy. Um, but no, that's good. That's great. That's great. Um, I actually might. I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk to you offline with some things that I have that I, I okay. kind of like. Yeah, I'm gonna follow up with you. Um, okay. <laughs> so before I um kind of you know close the show with you know the things that you know how I guess I'm um, how I guess how our listeners can connect with you. I was like to throw out the question just for the year. Um, most of us usually have a word that guides us through the year. Um, and I know that we're, you know, at the beginning of 2021, do you have a word that's powering you for this year? Um, okay, a couple, I have not chosen my actual word, but just off the top of my head, a few are coming to mind. And one is gratefulness. Mm. I feel like I'm there. I'm a very goal oriented, driven person, but I want to make sure that I'm always grateful for all of the things that I have achieved, that I am achieving. And I actually, right here on my wall, I have an abundance list where I'm just listing all the good things that happen and like that have happened so far in the first, you know, couple of weeks of, of, of the year. And it's little things. So like, I went to Target and I saved $10 on these games because it rung up wrong. Or, you know, I ordered from Instacart and they were late. So I got a $10 credit. <laughs> like, it's all of these little things that you think might be small, but, but it's like, okay, I'm grateful for that. So while I'm going to continue to be goal oriented and focused and driven, I'm also going to think about all the things that I'm really grateful for. So I think my word would probably be grateful. I like that. Gratefulness. 
maybe. <laughs> yes, I like that. Gratitude takes you a Gratitude. long way. Yeah, it opens there you go. the door. That's the word. <laughs> Yeah, It'll right. get you further sometimes than your talent will. That's, yes. Yeah. So that's that's amazing. I love the fact that you like you literally like the the time the smallest things. A lot of times that we, not that we don't, but we don't appreciate in the moment for you to be like, no, I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write down the fact that Instacart was late. But I'm yeah. like, thank God they was late. Whatever happened, I'm so glad that they were late because it was able to work out in your favor. Your favor. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yes. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> so um, before we let you go, we do want to know how our listeners can connect with you. So if you don't mind sharing your socials or website information with us, and we'll make sure that everything is in our show notes. Yeah, so I'm most the the social media platform I'm most active on is Instagram. So you can find me on Instagram at Kiana A. Darden. Um, And then my website is kianadarden.com. So I have various resources. You can learn about like the various resources that I have available on either platform, my website or my Instagram page. Awesome. And she actually, she's being very modest uh, right now. But y'all, she's she also has a very giving heart because she is giving all of our listeners a special discount on her coaching program. So thank you oh, for that. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and we will include that all that information in our show notes as well. But Kuyana, we just want to thank you so much for joining us, having this conversation with us and really the work that you're doing and in your give back, you know, I know it's part of what you do, but it still is a give back because you are opening a door for most people that didn't know that this was possible and even know how to step in to enter into this space. So thank you for walking in your gift and yeah. using your passions to help power somebody else. <laughs> thank y'all for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yes, 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 yes. Um, Guys, I just want to say, you know, as a note, as always, as we wrap that, you know, we thank you for always rocking with us and supporting us, lifting us as well as our guests that share with us on this on this show. Um, your support really powers us to continue to move in this way. And we really, really, really are grateful for you all. Um, you know, it's always our mission, our aim to share the stories of these beautiful Black women. Um, it's our aim to share in our lessons and celebrate our successes. And I feel like we have successfully done that today. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have anything, Terry, that you want to share before we go? No, no, no. I just, like I said, I, I appreciate Kriana and her work um, and just her spirit and her energy. And um, I feel like I learned some cool things today, just as far as the writing process and how you can throw yourself into that realm, you know. So even though, like I said, that's not my thing, but I know I may know of other people who want to get enter into that space um, at another level and I can share these gems with them. But also, you know, let them know to click on that download button, go ahead and listen to their conversation so they can hear it for themselves. <laughs> but um, no, this has been fun. I've thoroughly enjoyed you. I've been, um, enjoyed um, having this conversation with you. Um, so thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm. Well, if there isn't anything else on that note, until next time, Melanate on that. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed our chat today. Keep the conversation going by heading to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leaving us a review. Have a story of your own to share? Email us at info at melanatedconversations.com or connect with us on social media at Melanated Conversations. Till next time, keep raising your voice. voice.